So welcome to Indivisible. I'm Bob Burnett, I'm your host, and we welcome everyone. We're going to talk tonight about an extremely important subject, which is reaching out to Trump voters. It's part of an effort on our part to give trainings regularly, not only for our, for our members here in the East Bay, but also throughout the country. So we see this as part of an ongoing series. Um, and it's an essential part of our effort to restore democracy and take back our country. So in order to honor our country, I would like you to please rise and we're gonna sing God Bless America. God bless America, land that I love. Stand beside her and guide her through the night with the light from above. From the mountains, to the prairies, to the oceans, white with foam, God bless America, my home sweet home. That was my daughter-in-law, Rebecca Costelli. We're gonna get into the program soon, but I could not miss this opportunity to uh, alert you to the fact that we've, we're celebrating an important birthday. Indivisible is now four months old. And in that, in that time, we've accomplished, I think, quite a lot. We have 5,983 chapters. We have at least two chapters of Indivisible in every congressional district, an average of 13. The largest Indivisible chapter that we know about is in Austin, Texas, with 10,000 people. There are 980 chapters in California. And there are five chapters in Roswell, Georgia. <laughs> Roswell, Georgia is the home of Congressional District 6, where tomorrow our man, John Ossoff, runs, we hope, for Congress. Good luck to you in Georgia. We know that they're looking in tonight. So thank you. So thank you, Indivisible, for helping all of us organize so we could save ECA. Help, help, thank you for helping us organize so that we could all go to airports and to other ports into the country to save immigrants and for us to organize to so hold hundreds of town halls. Thank you, Indivisible, for the important work you're doing. Now, one of the, the, of the values of Indivisible is inclusivity. And another value is nonviolence. And uh, it's an important thing for us, you know, in rebuilding democracy to reach out to everyone, to, you know, our, our sisters and brothers who have got questionable you know, immigration status for people that are a different color or a different race or a different, or a different ethnicity. And it's also important for us to reach out for those members of our family that have gone astray, that have, 
that have that 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 somehow voted for, for voted for Trump, and when we reached out to our community here and we said, "What kind of training would you like?" Overwhelmingly, people said, "I need to know how to talk to to these members of my family because I love them." It's not an academic exercise. Uh, the the great Buddhist monk Thich Nhat Hanh says that nonviolence is love in action. So reaching out to these members of our family is an exercise in nonviolence. It's an exercise in love in action. But it's not easy. So we've got with us tonight two wonderful experts bringing, bringing their knowledge to bear on how do we talk to these difficult members of our family. So the, the format of the of our presentation tonight is going to be as follows. When I stop talking, which mercifully will be soon, um, then I will introduce I will introduce Arlie, Arlie and the, and I will introduce George and say a little bit about them, um, and then each of them will talk for about 15 minutes, basically giving them uh, giving you their perspective. Uh, by the way, George reminds me how complicated his field is, and so we we sent you you know. Uh, one of his writings in an interview, but we certainly just mean this as an introduction. But George promised me that he would come back until we all got it, right? So keep coming back. So, um, so tonight, uh, the way we're going to communicate uh, with questions is you've got cards on your chairs here, and the people in the, the digital universe uh, can, can, can tweet us at, at Indivisible Burke. And we're going to collect both of these for questions. So that's indivisible Burke. And when we, we start questions, which is about 8 o'clock, then, we then we'll collect for both, for both things. Um, I would be adverse if I did not tell you that we're pushi pushing four documents tonight. One of these is the indivisible guide. Many of you show, showed up here tonight, and you heard, heard about indivisible, but you did not read the guide. It is free. There's an audio version. It's in Espanol. There is no reason not to read this. It is terrific. The other document, the second document that we're pushing is the Constitution. <laughs> I urge you to read this. This is what we're defending. And my recommendation is, after you read it, you put it under your pillow and sleep with it. <laughs> and then we are, we are also, of course, going to sell out here and at your local booksellers this wonderful book by Arlie, which is called Strangers in Their Own Land. I'll say a little bit more about this. And George has published so many books. I brought my favorite, which is Moral Politics. So uh, I urge you to think about this as just the beginning of a process. And so because it is a process and because it's Berkeley, before we start, I'd like you to engage, just, just humor me and engage in a brief exercise turn to the person next to you and say um, who the Trump voter is you want to talk to, right? Just turn right now. And those of you in the Digiverse, you can turn to each other. Okay, that was great. Did everybody get a chance to share? Now, here's, here's, a, more, here's a more difficult one. See, I did it. It doesn't work, Kathleen. <laughs> okay, so here's a more difficult process. Turn to that same person and say, oh, by the way, if, if, with, when you turn to that person, you said, my whole family, um, there will be actually group therapy here at, at, <laughs> at, at, at 9 o'clock for those of you. And now I want you to turn to that same person. This will take a little bit longer. And I want you to tell that person what keeps you from having that conversation. Okay. What keeps you from talking to that Trump voter?
this is what you do. You hold it like okay. that, and then okay. ding it. But the problem is it will look like this. Yeah, yeah here. Sure. Okay. Give them a minute more. Now I want you to switch so the other person gets to talk. This is cup is in action. Oh, well, this is my Three times. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So just so just just asking how many people you can just put up your hands how many people have uh, when when the subject of you know what keeps me from talking to the Trump voter uh, how many people said anger is an issue right good so that that's a natural segue to to Pro Professor Hochschild um, after the election. I was, I was first in shock, and then I was so angry. And fortunately, I remembered a couple of weeks afterwards that I had downloaded your book onto Kindle. And I read it, and it was transformative. Uh, that, that I, if you haven't read the book, I say it, it, it gave me an insight into Trump voters in, in, in deplorable circumstances in Louisiana, heart-wrenching circumstances that um, I, had, I had just never had before, and it transformed my attitude. So, and so I, I loved it so much, I actually got a hard copy so I could mark <laughs> it up. True story. So it's with very great pleasure that I want to present to you Arlie Arlie Hochschild, who's written this wonderful book. Thank you for being here. Oh, this is a wonderful occasion. And Bob, thank you very much for what you said. Um, uh, Bob has given us 15 minutes, and I tried to think how I could best uh, use mine. And I thought to do three things. First, to briefly take you with me on a journey that I have recently returned from, uh, five years of research in um, southwest Louisiana among Tea Party uh, enthusiasts and Trump voters. And then to kind of think what are the different ways we can approach a Trump voter and then tell you what what I, what I would urge on us. So uh, in 2011, um, the thought occurred to me sitting in my office in the sociology department at UC Berkeley, here in Berkeley in California, blue, 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 super blue, that I was um, uh, in, in a very divided country that I read in the papers things uh, about people that believed things I couldn't understand or believe, and that the Congress was at a standstill, and that I lived in a bubble, you know, a geographic bubble, an electronic bubble, a media bubble, and that I had to get out of my bubble and into a bubble that was as far right as the sociology department in Berkeley, California is left. And uh, that I would try to take my moral and political alarm system off and permit myself a great deal of curiosity about people that I knew well uh, had fundamental differences in how they saw the world and the experiences that led them to see it as they did. So uh, I wanted to climb an empathy wall, as I came to call it. And so um, that opposite bubble turned out to be in the south. It turned out to be Louisiana, which is the super south. 
And it fit a kind of a red state paradox that we all scratch our heads about. How could it be that the red states, the poorest states, the states that are, um, have the worst education, the worst health, the most disrupted families, the lowest life expectancy, um, the most pollution, are also the states that take more money from the federal government in aid than they give to it in uh, tax dollars, and they revile the federal government. Oh, well, wait, well, you no, know, uh, didn't get it. Paradox. If you have trouble, wouldn't you want some help with it? And it turned out Louisiana was an exaggerated version of this because it's the second poorest state in the union. It's uh, a dead last in education and in all the others. It has a life expectancy about like Nicaragua's. And 44% of the state budget came from the federal government. And it was super Tea Party and very, very uh, much uh, right, right wing and enthusiastically went for Trump this last election. So I thought, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is what I don't get, and that's why I'm here. Um, and the first surprise to me was that people were very open. They weren't hostile. Um, and I uh, went to, f for starters, many things, the books will tell you, but uh, to meetings of uh, Republican women of Southwest Louisiana, and I would sit down around a table of eight and get their names and interview them later and then their husbands and families. Um, and I would say exactly who I was. I was a retired professor of sociology, but I'm worried about this divide that is taking, getting worse and worse and more and more bitter. Um, and they would say, yeah. We're worried about it, too. Um, and then they would say, you know, thanks for coming, actually. We are the South. People look down on us. People think we're just backward here. They think we're racist. They think we're homophobic. They think we're sexist. They think we're fat. <laughs> and um, that uh, we're uneducated and stupid. So you set them straight. Yeah. So come on, let's come to the fish fry. You know, come to church with me. I'll show you where I went to school, where I was born, where my parents were buried. So that was an experience. And uh, I won't give the punchline away here because uh, there isn't time. But I learned that they knew very well about this red state paradox. But it wasn't as important as other things were. They did not feel heard. And when they looked at the Democratic uh, platform and the, the way in which they were seen by, they felt, liberals and Democrats, they felt invisible. They felt their issues, which were real, uh, were not, in fact, addressed. So I went with the red state paradox, but came back with the blue state paradox, that gosh, how could it be that the Democratic Party, the party of the working man and woman, was losing uh, working men and women by droves? And I was in the middle of the drove being lost. So uh, I've been back there uh, twice since the book. I gave them books, put on a dinner for them. Uh, this last time I went back with my son to try and find um, common ground He's uh, a very much a Berkeley person and is a big environmentalist. And the person I was trying to get him together with uh, is a big tea party and doesn't believe in regulating the polluters. So I wanted to go fishing, see if we could get a little common ground on this issue, because this man had suffered greatly from environmental pollution. Um, so all of this, this experience, uh, and the relationships that I retain um, uh, has led me to this to second point I'd like to make here, which is how, how are we going to look at Trump supporters? I think I can think of three ways. One is to turn a back on them and say, I'm just so mad, you know, I don't want to talk to them. And they're, they're really 
infuriating. They're bringing this country down. They're fascists, and why should I deal with people like this? And there was a recent review, a respectful review of, of my book by Frank Rich, and I normally like Frank Rich. <laughs> But uh, it was in uh, New York Magazine. But he read this book, which focuses on pollution suffered by the very people who oppose regulating polluters. So another version, a keyhole issue into the red state paradox. Here is what Frank Rich says about it. Maybe like Hoke Shield's new friends in Louisiana's oil country, <laughs> <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> They'll keep voting their interests, uh, 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 voting against their own interests until the industrial poisons left unregulated by their favorite politicians finish them off altogether. <laughs> the best course of action may be to respect their right to choose. <laughs> so, okay, you can go with that. You know, so he thinks my empathy wall is kind of mamby-pamby and, you know, a feel-good thing and uh, doesn't make uh, a deep sense. And so he would be very uh, unhappy to have me say that I empathize with <laughs> actually Rich in this respect. I get it why he's mad. But I think it's extremely unwise to follow that and to end with a kind of a state of anger and think that you're doing something that goes along with the pledge that we just said, or in any way enlarging yourself or making it a better world by, by leaving it there. Uh, I would say for people that angry, you don't have to do this. You don't have to talk to Trump. People. No one's making you do it. But I, I would urge an alternate course. The second option, first is refusal. The second option is to get your skateboard and batch, bash it over the head of some, uh, someone who disagrees with you. And we have been subjected to uh, three times in a row uh, expressions of great violence um, uh, the last time just a few days ago. And uh, I'm appalled by this and chagrined by this. And you should know, I hear about it from my Louisiana friends. Oh, oh, you at Berkeley. You, you're all dressed in black and you're organized, although you call yourself anarchists. <laughs> and, um, and, and you just resort to uh, uh, great violence. You, you don't believe in dialogue and are respecting other people that differ with you. And I just apologize for us. But you should know that they who, who speak the language of violence, in the eyes of many Trump supporters, they represent us. So we must in every way, I think, disavow this uh, this violence. Uh, uh, hugely important. One even referred to uh, these people, oh, the Berkeley brown shirts. So uh, we should know how we're seen, and that's one of the virtues of the next thing I'm going to say, which is. Um, if you don't want to avoid uh, and you don't want to uh, prevent and counter through violence, you want to really uh, uh, step out and get to know uh, people that differ from you, I think there's enormous opportunity and I feel the time is ripe. I'm just getting emails from people. Uh, one woman just two days ago said, well, I read your book. I'm in an Episcopal church outside Boston. Could you give me the name of one of the people that you uh, interviewed? I'd like uh, my church to get together with their church and see if we can find common ground. Um, so uh, there have been schools. I know UC Berkeley is now uh, thinking of having a kind of program with the University of Mississippi and Texas A&M, um, you know, a, for students in the same, with the same interests to uh, each have a semester in the other one's university. So um, 
a lot of, of possibilities. And I guess what I would love to see is schools all across the country where that have the opportunity to um, have to do what I just did, actually, and to get what I came to call in the book the deep story of the people that you differ with and to see what led them to believe the deep story and figure out what your own deep story is. I'd love to see seniors in all high schools um, spend, say, three weeks with a host family in an inland school. I'd like inland kids to go to the coast. I'd like the southern kids uh, in southern high schools to uh, spend a three-week visit with families in the north. The north comes south. And in this way, maybe they could do something, not just break bread together, but do a Habitat for Humanity type of project together that they both agreed to begin with was a good thing to do. And then in the conversations, they will discover that they live in two different truths. We live in different truths. That is, what we believe is true, they do not uh, believe in true. They're a, a Fox News truth <laughs> and Breitbart truth. And so rather than say, oh, you're wrong, you can say, well, how did you hear about that? Where did you learn that? Uh-huh. And, and go, go to a little talk about sources. So anyway, I, I think there are enormous possibilities for this. And what it takes most basically, I guess this would be my last point, is that there are two ways of speaking with my talk. But you can use talk in a very different way with your alarm system and, and where your talk has the function of eliciting the perspective of another. And you know, we do this all the time. It's no mystery. We cross empathy walls. We take our alarm systems off, especially Anyone in the room that has children <laughs> does this on pretty much a daily basis. What the only unusual thing is to apply that perspective and that as, as the opposite. So that's the invitation and that's the extraordinary experience that I think we will, those of us who are up for it. Um, um, the next speaker is George Lakoff. George is a friend of mine. And I thought about what I'd say, and, I, and so I'll start by saying, George is a really smart guy that's written a bunch of really good books. Um, but um, I'm gonna tell you two stories. After the election, um, for those of you in the Digiverse, if you come to Berkeley, you'll find that it's a city of 100,000 people. In and it's something we learned in cognitive science very well. That is, we think metaphorically all the time. It is normal. It is unconscious. 98% of thought is unconscious. 98%. The reason it is unconscious is a very basic thing. Ideas don't float in the air. Ideas are in your neural circuitry. They're characterized by neural circuitry. We're finishing a book now called The Neural Mind, telling how that happens. And we know a lot about how that happens. But the main thing about it is that when ideas are in your neural circuitry and you get complex ideas, uh, the more that you use those ideas, the more they're activated, the stronger those circuits get. And when you grow up, you get very strong circuits for many, many things in terms of your beliefs, in terms of your understandings, etc. You have worldviews that you use all the time, not just about politics, but about just about everything, various worldviews. Those are complexes of neural circuits, right? And what that means is those neural circuits are fixed, that you don't, aren't aware of them because you don't have conscious access to your neural circuitry. That's why they're 98% unconscious. But they're there, and they constitute what I'll call a neural filter. What happens when you hear facts, no matter what you believe, when you hear facts that don't fit your neural circuitry. There are various possibilities. One, you might not notice them. You might ignore them. You might um, reject them. 
you might ridicule them or you might attack them or you might be puzzled by them, whatever. The point is that they're not just there. And what's most interesting is that within about a, a tenth of a second, you can change them to fit your neural circuitry. You change them. And there are lots of experiments that show such changes. It takes about 80 milliseconds. That is you know, very quick. Now, that's remarkable, and it creates what I'll call a neural filter, and you see it on TV every day. And you see it in the divide in our country, in the worldview divide. It's there, and it's real on all sides. But then you see something else. There are people who are called moderates. What is a moderate? A moderate conservative is somebody who has partly progressive views on something or other, different things. A moderate progressive is someone who has some conservative views on some things or other, different ones from person to person. There is no ideology of the moderate. There's no set of beliefs that all moderates have. There are variations on others. You have a major worldview and a minor worldview. And they're different. Not only are they different, but there's a very important part about that. Because everything in politics is about morality. Everything. How do you know? Very simple. If someone gets up as a politician and says, here's my policies, do what I say, here's what I recommend, the assumption is that they're right, not wrong. They don't get up and say, this is evil, but do it. They don't get up and say, it doesn't matter, but do it. The assumption is it's right. And if they have opposite policies, they have different notions of what's right and wrong. And often, those notions are part of their unconscious neural filter. Very, very commonly, and we see that every day. They're there, and they have opposite views of right and wrong, and that's what we're encountering. So the question is, what are those opposite views of right and wrong, and how do they work? Uh, in 1994, uh, when I read the uh, contract with America and asked this question and found out that the nation was a family, metaphorically for most people, often unconsciously, but naturally, what I discovered was that if there are two different views of the nation, there are two different views of the family. And I sat down and, as a cognitive scientist, worked for about six months and worked them out in detail. And they turned out to be very common views. Uh, for progressives, there is what I'll call a nurturant family view. And it goes like this. For nurturant parents, you have empathy for your children. You need to understand what all those cries mean with the infants. You have to, uh, you want to take care of them, protect them, support them. You want to be, them to be healthy and strong, and you want them to be fulfilled in life. That's why you have all of those soccer games and dance classes and you know, music lessons and so on, uh, and, and education. And not only that, you want them to grow up to be like that. You want them to care about other people. You want them to take care of themselves and others. And you want them to want other people to be fulfilled in life. That's what it is to... Uh, to be a nurturing parent, and many of you will know this and recognize it. What does that say about your politics? When you map that onto politics, it says a simple thing that defines what progressive thought is. Namely, citizens care about other citizens, empathize with them. They um, work through their government to provide public resources for the well-being and freedom of all, everybody, starting with business. You can't have a business without public resources. And this began with the beginning of this country. When the country was formed, we had roads and bridges. You know, people could get their goods out there as well as ordinary people travel. You had interstate commerce laws, so you could ship things across states. You had um, national bank, a patent office, public education for educated folks. Uh, a judicial system, 90% for, cor for corporate law, business law. In short, you couldn't run a business without public resources, either private life. The in basic principle is simple. The private depends upon the public, not the government. The government is an instrument. It's the public. It's you guys, all of us, and, and all of us of all stripes, everybody. Now, that is something that a lot of Republicans deny. They say, we all did it ourselves. 
you know, we built those roads and um, we put in those sewers and so on, sure. But, uh, and Elizabeth Warren has been very articulate about this. But uh, beyond that, uh, there's something more. These days, we have science and technology. Where did it come from? You know, where did you get um, uh, computer science from? Answer, the NSF supported it through. I was there at MIT in 1958, believe it or not, a long time ago, uh, when uh, Marvin Minsky was a new assistant professor. But everybody who was doing this was supported by the NSF. Where did you get satellite communication from? NASA and NOAA. Where did you, um, and the Defense Department, supporting all of those, um, you know, military installations at Hughes Aircraft and other places, all paid for by the public. Uh, what about uh, other more interesting things like cell phones and GPS systems, right? You have a Defense Department setting up system of satellites at 51 degrees uh, around the Earth, uh, away from the equator, uh, so that at any point on Earth, four of them are in contact with that part on Earth. There, if, if any of them crap out, there are a few extras. And um, you beam up at the speed of light from your cell phone, messages up there, <clears throat> and somehow, uh, technically, the closest one picks it up. Now, the, the tr speed travels from at the speed of light from one to another, but they're switching circuits. You have to switch them and send them in the right direction. And then it has to go, if you're going to go around the earth or go around the country, it's got to go from here through at least a dozen others. All right? How fast do they have to go? How fast are the switching circuits going? Nanoseconds, billionths of a second. What happens if you're a millionth of a second off? You're hundreds of miles off. Think about that. How, now, how many people in the world and how many businesses in the world depend upon cell phones? Almost all. We are supporting the economy of the world and the private communication of the world. You and I. Now, that's not something that is said. But you know, as soon as you point this sort of thing out, it's recognized. It's important to understand it. You know, People talk about the cost of health care, you know, and how expensive it is. Where did that health care come from? Where did you get medical stuff from? Okay? So it's from all of those resources. It's not said. Now, how do you talk to other folks? What, is, what happens on the other side? What is their view of the family? It's what I call a strict father family, and it has a different moral system. It says the, fam the father is in charge because he knows right from wrong. His job is to make sure his children do right from wrong by punishing them painfully enough when they do wrong so that they'll try to avoid it and do right, namely do what he says, which is defines as being right. And that's called tough love. Now, when that happens, there, is, there are consequences. That is, if they do that, they will, ha they will not just do what feels good. You've heard of feel good liberalism. Liberals are not have strict enough fathers. Um, they just do what feels good. But if they don't, then they have to have discipline. And if they have that discipline, they can go out in the world and be prosperous. And what if they're not prosperous? Then they don't have discipline, they're not moral, and they deserve their poverty. Hence, poor people, you know, just don't have it. They deserve that. They deserve to be poor. They're not disciplined. Now, there's a further thing. It says this is the way the world is. And that means that the, if you look at history, nature will have told you who the winners are. The winners are the better people. And that gives you a moral hierarchy. It comes like religion has won out, so it's God above man. We have conquered nature, where nature is there for us to just take what we need. Man above nature. You have the strong above the weak. You need strong armies. Uh, you have uh, rich above the poor. They deserve it. The employers above employees. Uh, adults above children. Uh, in 21 states, uh, uh, coaches and uh, teachers can beat children with sticks and paddles if they don't just do what they're told or if they sass them or, you know, talk back. Uh, then you have 
Western culture above non-Western culture, America above other countries, men above women, whites above non-whites, Christians above non-Christians, straights above gays, all from one principle, the strict father family. They're not different. Now, what's important is that these are folks who, vo who have that view. If you have that moral view, that defines who you are as a person. Your morality defines you as a person. And no matter how poor you are, if you have that view at home, then what's going to happen is you're going to feel like that is the view that the world should have. And if it doesn't have it, you are oppressed. Even though it doesn't matter how poor you are, you will vote against your interests and so on. Now, what's important about that is that people who have strict father morality also have in-group nurturance. They care about people in their in-group, in their churches, in their military units, you know, the people they go bowling with, the people they, uh, you know, go to Fourth of July picnics with, etc. They care about them, and they show that care. If there's a flood, they're out there swinging the sandbags. If there are fire ba fires out there, uh, threatening their neighbors' homes, they're out there on the fire lines. These are the people you met. And when you're in that group, as the sailors in our rooming house were, they're fine folks. You can talk to them. How? Not about policy, not about uh, progressive slogans, but about real things in real lives. You can talk to them about freedom and how education gives you freedom. You're not free if you're not educated. How health care, if you don't have health care, you get cancer, you're not free. You can talk to them about, uh, you know, people who get sick, about what's, what's going wrong in, uh, you know, uh, with their fish. You can talk to them about what the pollution is that making, that's making them sick. You can talk to them about that not from the point of view of the normal progressive liberal discourse, but to, from the point of view of simple human beings. Thank you. So I thought, what's the best way to conduct a conversation between the two that have such, such, wonderful, um, with such wonderful research and um, I reread your books, and I came up with what I think are seven common threads. So, um, but before I share that, um, I want to do a nuts and bolts kind of thing for you all, if you'll permit me, um, because it's not actually simple to sit down with Uncle with Uncle Al, who you know. You, you love it at, at some events, but who somehow mysteriously voted for Trump. So I, I, wrote, I wrote down um, eight things that uh, I'd like you to consider before you think about engaging with Uncle Al in this difficult conversation. Why did you vote for Trump? Um, and feel free to, to add or, or comment. Number one is do it in a private setting. That is, it doesn't work to do it at the, at the Thanksgiving dinner when you've all had a couple of beers. That is not actually a felicitous situation. Do it in a private setting. The second thing is leave plenty of time. In other words, you don't want to do it at the halftime of the Warriors-Cavaliers game. That's not enough time. Um, start, that is you all, start with the intention to listen and make sure you have the energy. In other words, you could have this intention, but if you're getting over a cold or whatever, don't do it. Um, the next point is sustain eye contact. Um, and I want to just stop here and say, it's okay to practice these things before you actually have the conversation with Uncle Al. That's, that's totally legitimate. You could have a, a close friend say, you be Uncle Al, and I'll try to talk to you. Um, the next thing is very difficult. It's called recognizing if you're triggered. Triggering is a whole 
training session that we can do, but fundamentally it means that if you're talking to Uncle Al and suddenly you get irrationally angry or you go blank, you're triggered. And, and that, you know, again, if you practice, you can recognize that. If you get triggered, then you can take a time out. You can say, Uncle Al, I love you, but I'm, I'm, I'm starting to lose it here, and I just need to take a little, a little break, right, and do whatever seems. And then finally, it's okay to take more than one session. That is, Uncle Al, you know, you may make a little bit of progress, and you may say, that's fine, but I still am not finished talking to you. So I, 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 give, I give you each of these, and now here are my seven common threads. That, that, that none of you, that none of you have, uh, that neither have seen, but I just thought this to me um, links, links, you know, what I read from your books. And uh, by the way, my, my, my crew is reminding me to tell you that after this is through, we're going to take your tweets um, f that come to at Indivisible Burke, and also um, if you, if you have questions that you write down, we're going to start collecting these questions. So if you have questions, um, put your hands up, and uh, our training team will come and collect the question cards from you. So here, the first, the first thing that I got from, 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 your, from, from your books. One is to remember to listen. Trump voters expect, ex expect us, liberals, progressives, whatever we call ourselves, to disrespect them. Therefore, no matter how outrageous the Trump voters' statements are, listen to them. And perhaps comment, I'm interested that you think that. Well, this is very good. Um, uh, I, I think that uh, is, fits with um, what I did. I often was told, oh, but you're nice. <laughs> <laughs> I said, actually, we're all, we're all like me. <laughs> uh, uh, um, and it had to do with feeling that they would be attacked, that they would be demeaned, that they wouldn't be listened to. It's amazing how powerful listening turns out to be. Um, I'll just tell you one, one yeah. little free association. I um, uh, met a woman who said, I love Rush Limbaugh, you know, the conservative radio host. And I had a moment, I think, and then thought, <laughs> I'd love to talk to you about that. Um, uh, that's really interesting to me. And so can we meet for sweet teas in the next few days? Yes, yeah, sure. So we sit down a few days later, and she explains that she loves Rush Limbaugh because he hates feminazis. <laughs> I'm glad she hadn't read any of my books. <laughs> um, and then uh, and he hates environmental wackos. Again, uh, glad she hasn't met my son. Um, and uh, so, and she goes through this, and um, then she says to me, has it been hard for you to hear what I'm saying? I, I felt looked at, okay. And I told her, you know, honestly, it's not. The reason I'm here is to learn from you and you are uh, giving me a great gift, and I can't tell you how grateful I am. You're telling me what you believe in your experiences, and I take that as a big gift. And she said back, you know, I can take my alarm system off too. <laughs> okay, and then we had that in common. Okay, and then we took it from there. See, and then you get to a different way of talking about things, and people share their doubts. I went back this last time uh, with uh, 
my son to meet, uh, if you've met the book, he's a guy named Mike who was born on a sugar plantation, Old South, and worked in oil all his adulthood, sort of the new South. So big Trump person, he's wearing his Louisiana Tea Party shirt. And uh, we're out fishing in a boat. And I ask him, well, um, Mike, how about race? How, I figure he couldn't leave the boat. <laughs> so how does this fit in? And so he talks about it. He said, well, actually, I'm a reformed bigot. And, uh, well, what's a bigot? And um, I'll, I won't go on much longer than this, but just, uh, so we get down to it. And I ask him, well, what was it like um, when your high school was integrated, he said, my first year of high school, there were two blacks, and by the last year, it was half black. And I asked him, and did you make any new friends? There was a very long pause, and then he said, you're making me think. And when you can get to that place with another person, however different their premises are, how, however their neuro <laughs> wiring is, it's a wonderful place to be at and to have your conversation. So I would add to these, maybe see if you can go back and forth, express your own doubts about things until you can get to that level of openness. So, so I'm going to go to number two because just we're running out of time. My number two is do not insult Trump. Trump voters identify with Trump. I got this from you, George. To them, he's successful, politically incorrect, they love that, and someone who has beaten the system. After they say something positive about Trump, reply, I hear that, but I'm worried about corruption and safety. Corruption because Trump will not reveal his income taxes and safety because of his ties to Russia. What do you think about that? Well, <clears throat> the very first thing that um, is taught at the Leadership Institute in Virginia where they train 160,000 uh, you know, Republicans to go out and speak in their communities over 20 years, is not to use the words of the other side, even to argue against them. And it's very simple. I wrote a book called Don't Think of an Elephant, Makes You Think of an Elephant. Nixon said, I am not a crook. Made you think of him as a crook. You know, when you argue, so every time you argue against a position on the other side, you strengthen it. Very important not to do that. Now, what do you do instead? What you have to do instead is protect you. Uh, Trump said, we want to get rid of three quarters of the regulations. If he had said, we want to get rid of three quarters of the protections, it would have sounded very different. And, yeah, or the new sheriff is in town. I'm, you know, I'm the, the sheriff. I'm in charge, you know, here. You know, well, who is this sheriff? You know, what is the sheriff there? He's supposed to protect you. That's the point. It's to protect you. And that is something that you need to be doing. But the, there's a general principle here. The general principle is shift the viewpoint from the powerful to those who are affected by the power. And there are lots of examples. We give you, the, you know, we're job creators. They don't give you jobs because you're nice. They, they like you or something. They give you jobs because you're profit creators for them. All right? As soon as you say you're profit creators, you should get a fair share of the profits and be treated well. Uh, and this is true for hundreds and hundreds of things. As soon as you shift that viewpoint, you can, you can do things. And that's very, very important. Another reason is that as soon as you ask... How did some, if some people talk about privatization, privatizing education, privatizing whatever, you say, where did that come from? And it came from public resources. All of this stuff, as we saw in, you know, a privatization of companies. 
They all depend on pri public resources. As soon as you ask where did computer science come from, there it is, with medicine and everything else. And that's important for your values, and it's a matter of sticking to your values. So now, framing is an important thing. We, we should get to that. I think you agreed with me, right? You sort of agreed oh, with me. Yeah, okay. So, so the third one is values. Trump voters usually have different values than we do. You've just said that, like, yeah. several times. Um, so our job is to be clear what our values are. We talked about, va we talked about the indivisible values. I've talked about them twice tonight, and you could all think about these. Do you share these values? The primary values are inclusivity and nonviolence. Those are deep and important values to be clarified about what they are. So in your Trump conversation with Trump voters, search for common ground. This is what you did. Um, for example, does the Trump voter believe in the golden rule? Do they believe in caring? I got this from your article. If so, how does that apply to their treatment of people of color? Can they care for a person of a different race? That's you know important thing. What are our values? Fairness. Most Trump voters see the world as an elaborate hierarchy. Both of your articles, I was struck by, you have this great, this metaphor about people standing in line. Do you wanna, this is, can, I think this okay. is Okay, okay. <laughs> yeah, I came to feel that underneath all of the uh, uh, beliefs people had was uh, very much as George says, a metaphor, a kind of an unconscious metaphor. And it was, we all have them. Uh, there's a right-leaning uh, deep story and a left-leaning deep story. What is a deep story? A deep story is life as it really feels. So you take facts out of the deep story, and you take moral convictions out of the deep story. It's just what's left, what feels true. And for the right-leaning people I met, the deep story was they were waiting in line as in a pilgrimage, facing the top of the hill at which, on which is the American dream. Their feet are tired, they're pointed toward this goal. Um, more than half of the people are behind them, but they're not looking behind, they're looking ahead. And the line hasn't moved. I talked to people who hadn't had a raise in two decades and uh, looking toward retirement so they weren't ever gonna get it and they were facing this American dream. They actually had part of the American dream, but they felt like holding on to it. <laughs> that was their a fear of it being taken away. So then there is a moment in this uh, experience of waiting in line, which they notice there are line cutters. And they think, well, that's not fair. Who's cutting in line? Well, it would be blacks who through federal uh, affirmative action programs now finally have access to jobs that had be re been reserved for whites. And even more numerous were women who now finally have access through federal affirmative action programs, jobs that had been reserved for men, and then immigrants undocumented, and then refugees. Um, and they even saw the oil-soaked uh, Louisiana uh, a, a pelican, a brown pelican endangered, as cutting in line ahead of them. All those liberals put animals ahead of people all these line cutters, and then another moment in this deep story, there's Barack Obama, who should be impartially governing the line, uh, observing it, uh, who seems to be waving to the line cutters. Oh, he's their president, and he can't see us. He can't see us, he's not our president. He's, uh, he's putting them ahead. In fact, he's a line cutter too, isn't he? How many times did I hear people say, how did his mother, a single mother, pay for a Harvard education? That's a fortune. Uh, something fishy, something fishy. Uh, so the final moment of, of the right wing deep story, someone ahead of you in line, more educated, maybe from a coast, maybe from Berkeley. 
turns around and says, you limited, uneducated, backward, uh, prejudiced, redneck. And that, that was it. Then you are a stranger in your own land. You are, for all your, everything about you that you want, recognize the honor you seek um, is uh, invisible to them. You are invisible, you're the stranger, and you're looking for someone to take you out of this situation to restore your honor. America, uh, make America great again. So if we're dealing with someone that, that sees the world in this way, you know, we've got to search for common ground. And, you know, my suggestion here is all Americans cherish the myth of the, the little guy, the little person who started with nothing and fought his or her way to the top. So in searching for common ground, um, we can come to this notion of fairness, the notion of the, don't you and I, Uncle Al, you know, agree that if you work hard, you should be able to reach for the stars. Now I want to remind people again to give us your, your questions and or to send us tweets. I want to do one more thing and then stop and then let the questions come in. And that's on climate change because again, in reading, reading what you've written, it seems to me that you agree on climate change. And it's a harsh truth. Most Trump voters do not believe in climate change. They do not believe it's real. So rather than take on this issue in general with Uncle Al, talk about a specific local issue such as contaminated water, polluted air, or fracking, and say to Uncle Al, gee, I believe that we should protect our children from contaminated water. Don't you agree? What do you think, George? That's part of the local approach to this. When you have, when you're doing, dealing with in-group nurturance, and very important to do that. Uh, but there is another part of this, which has to do with what I'll call systemic versus direct causation. And it turns out uh, liberals have an easier time understanding systemic causation. But every language in the world allows you to think about direct causation. I pick up a glass of water, I take a drink. Direct causation, right? Now, uh, if you believe in direct causation, if it's snowing in Washington, D.C., Senator Inhofe can go out and make a snowball and say, what do you mean? Uh, there's no global warming, it's snowing, right? Now, if you know anything about this, it, you know, you have evaporation of the Pacific, lots of, of moisture goes over the pole in winter, it's dark, it turns to snow, comes down in Washington, D.C. You have a chain of causes, that's systemic causation. There are four types, we've worked it out. There's, a, there's, a, there's knowledge about it. But why is it that every language in the world has direct causation and no language has systemic causation? It's very simple. Language is learned by three-year-olds. <laughs> very, you know. But systemic causation is real, and we're you know, looking uh, for a way to get cartoonists to, to uh, work with the climate scientists to get this onto every weatherman's app. <laughs> so uh, we want to do, this is real, we're trying to do this right now. So that's another uh, very important uh, thing to do. Uncle Al, um, what are you most proud of that you've done to help other people? And you will find that Uncle Hal has done probably three things in his life, or more, to help other people. And every time you see Uncle Al, ask them about those three things and how he felt, because that will strengthen in his brain the idea of taking care of others. One final thing. Abraham Lincoln got something right that we're finally beginning to understand when he talked about a government of, by, and for the people. We thought that just elections would get guarantee that. We find that it isn't true. Right now, what about government of the people? It means the same people are in the government as us. But when you have a gag rule that has been put on the, all of the, uh, you know, the government agencies, when you cannot communicate with the public, it's no longer government of the people because when it's of the people, you have free communication. So that's been taken away. 
by the people. Well, the people running the government should have the same experiences as ordinary people. When you have your billionaires running all of the, the cabinet jobs, it's not by the people. For the people, government takes care of its citizens. Care is part of democracy. Care is important. And when people are, you know, say you, the government spends money to help people, what does that mean? It means, one, that's their job. It's part of democracy. And two, if it's helping people to get educations or health or some, something like that, what happens is that money comes back into the economy. And that helps everybody else. You know, it's important to understand that. Someone says, we shouldn't be paying for anybody else's medical care. The answer is, we already did. The reason we have modern medicine is, we paid to have all those people trained. We paid through the NIH to get that research done. We paid through the NIH to develop all those drugs and do all those things in universities. We already paid for modern medicine. The idea of having uh, a universal health care or Medicare for all is something we've already paid for. It's something that, uh, that, people have, that the public has earned. It is an investment where we all reap the dividends and no one's talking about it. Now, framing is a very important thing. Talking about protections versus regulations. Talking about you, know, uh, you are profit creators and things like that. Now, if you ask someone about this and you say, hey, do you believe that um, you know, uh, workers, people who work are profit creators? You say, yeah. Have you ever said it? No. Would you say it? Well, I don't know. Well, you gotta say it. You've got to talk about protections, not regulations. What are unions? Unions are instruments of freedom, freedom from corporate servitude, period. They create freedom for you. you talk, I've talked to you know, people who are the, the people do publicity for this AFL-CIO. They all agree that it's true, and none of them have ever said it or would. And that is something that, that you, as people and in indivisible, have to be doing. Say what is true. Shift the viewpoint from the powerful to the people affected. Good. And use that language. Good. Thank you. <laughs> wow. So um, now we're going to take questions from the, uh, we've got two streams of questions, one from the cards and one from the from tweets. So I'm going to hand the microphone to, to Rachel, and we've got another microphone up here, and we'll respond with that. Okay, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Do Trump voters and or strict father conservatives have something to teach us? <clears throat> Is this, can you hear me? Yes, there we go. Um, if I ask myself, uh, you know, uh, do I have those attitudes in any part of my life, and do other people who've been professors have them, the answer is sure. You've got to do your homework. You get, you know, I don't grade you. You grade yourselves by doing your homework. You know, very simple. But that is part of the idea that uh, there is individual responsibility here. You know, yes, you have, there is individual responsibility to care for yourself and others. You have both. And that's a very important kind of thing. You want to have people helping each other, you know, in a class, talking to each other, teaching each other, but also doing your homework. And it's not, you know, and that's important in the military. You have to have people who are uh, out there uh, taking care of the people, and there are often regulations. You don't leave one of your injured com comrades behind and so on. You just don't. That's, you know, uh, it's a strict rule, and you don't do it for a good reason. And there are plenty of these cases where, yes, you have to do these things for a good reason. And that is, and you might say, why, are, why is there strict father morality? 
Why do you have these two different versions? And it has to do with children's experience. Children uh, who are infants uh, may have two very different experiences. One, they can be nurtured and cared for, and they're better off if they are, but they're also better off if they listen to their parents when they're infants. And that idea is that if you listen to your parents, that means that you are obeying people who are taking care of you at that point and responsible for you. And that leads to a strict father morality. So both of those cases are not going to go away. We're always going to have this with us, and we have to learn how to function with it. We, we take a tweet. We, we'll see on this is from Jill on Facebook. As I was listening to Arlie, I was wondering if the Trump voters she met with were meeting about how to talk to us. <laughs> Why does it feel condescending to assume we must be the ones reaching out? Uh, no, they weren't that curious about us. Uh, and... Um, but I think that's okay. I think the shoe is on our foot to reach out to them. So um, they, in a way, conceived of me as a reporter uh, about them to you. <laughs> and that's, in fact, what I have been <laughs> um, because they felt misunderstood. They they felt, yeah, put down and hurt. And so spoken away from a kind of injured position. Um, they did uh, say, oh, well, I'm going to come and visit you in Berkeley and, uh, you know, check out all the naked hippies. <laughs> <laughs> I said, y'all come. <laughs> we'll look around. I don't think you'll find them. It's pretty chilly. <laughs> um, so... Uh, and they had a different way of, of discovering another person. They didn't, uh, like me, just ask questions. You know, well, where did you go to school? What level of school? You know, what was your job? I'm full of questions. No, no. They would observe and wait to s about me. They would wait and see how I acted. And I would later discover that they were really noticing a lot. They were picking up cues, but it was almost rude to be as intrusive as I was, right? So it was a different code. Next question. Next question. It works if you turn it on. Um, we got a couple of questions um, about abortion, and this actually seems the most to the point. How do I deal with a person who believes abortion is murder and that Trump is pro-life? There's a question about freedom and the freedom to control your body no matter what your gender. And that is a very important kind of issue. I mean, one could, you know, uh, try to give them facts about uh, what actually happens at conception and how there are groups of cells and uh, what they are and so on, uh, and how uh, any child developed that cannot develop outside the womb and, and so on. But the fact is, it is the child is part of a mother's body and the mother has a right to control her own body, just as every human being does. So there's a freedom issue here, and it's not talked about as a freedom issue. And that's one of the, the many things that needs to be shifted. Uh, it's very hard to shift, you know. I think the question is, uh, you can say this is a very important moral an emotional, psychological choice that any mother uh, who considers um, abortion makes. Uh, but uh, isn't it her choice, her decision? Do you want the government making that choice for you? Uh, and, 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 and
But I, I want to just add again to this that this is a, a, a really good example of a question where you must allow enough time to fully explore this question. This is not something that you can do in like 15 minutes. The, when this question comes up, the person who raises it, the, you know, the, the Uncle Al, you know, needs to fully, fully, fully explain their position and then, you know, and then you get a time to respond, but this is not gonna happen quickly. Do you believe in forced reproduction? That's the opposite of the freedom issue. You have to do both sides. That if there's no contraception available, if there's no sex education, uh, if there are other uh, conditions, rape doesn't matter, do you believe in forced reproduction is a place to start? You can also um, add, look at the Guttmacher uh, website with data. Many of the people I talked to were concerned about third uh, trimester uh, abortions, but actually it's something like less than 1% of, of such abortions are actually made. So that is conjured up as, as major when in fact it's extremely minor and usually in the, the to save the mother's life. Yeah, I want to add to that that one of the reasons I bought the hard copy of your book was so that I could read the appendices, which normally, and the footnotes. But actually, um, uh, at the end of, of, of Strangers in, in Their Own Land, um, you have... Doubts one-to-one uh, -one out fishing, but when it came to a Facebook, uh, they... they it was as if they were in full military armor. And um, so, yeah, better to be face to face and better to be doing something fun together. Next question. How do we convince anyone that those black shirters are not all of us? Black shirters, the, the, the violence, the, the anti-fascist violence, violent people here who come here are not all of us. Thank you for that question. Uh, I'm, I would love us all to go home and get an answer for that because this one fact, I think, does more harm than almost anything else, almost anything else. Oh, um, this has gotten completely turned around. And I think it's up to us to disavow the violent people among us. I actually emailed this guy, Mike, and said, I don't know, I feel terrible, but there have been some very uh, crazy guys. I don't know whether they're your crazy guys trying to make us look bad or they're my crazy guys um, that are making us look bad. And, uh, but I think it's my crazy men who, who are being very violent. And he said, yes, uh, the people, the talk around here in the bayou is that, yeah, these are the, the, the brown shirts. These are fascists and uh, uh, that uh, they won't listen to anyone else and uh, enforce their views on others. So I haven't answered the question except to say we ought to hold up signs uh, that say, um, um, Anarchists help Trump. Yes, there you go. Anarchists help Trump. Period. Um, Indivisible Berkeley is in the process of training nonviolent monitors, and we're we're doing we've we've started doing serious training, and we've looked back to um, the '60s to the anti-war. Uh, marches, and our model um, comes from a major demonstration that was done that theoretically was going to be attacked by the weather underground. And there were so many nonviolent monitors, something like 10,000 at this march, which was several hundred thousand people, that the weather underground basically could not get a toehold. So we must train nonviolent monitors. We must clarify to everyone that we are nonviolent and totally disavow the anarchists. Wow. 
Any suggestions for how to truly be inclusive and work together with communities of color? Uh, once you understand uh, how that moral hierarchy comes out of strict father morality, you see that, there, that racism doesn't have a different source from Islamophobia, from anti-Semitism, from uh, you know, uh, anti-feminism, and so on. They all have one source. And, uh, and, and also people putting down people who are poor. It, it's one source, and uh, the idea that uh, you uh, you know are helping people of color is not different from helping poor people in Appalachia. I had a feeling that the conversation about race had stopped among the people I got to know around 1967. In other words, the conversations that were common then uh, were still common there. And that one would have to go back and gently begin this conversation again. Like when I asked this guy, uh, um, did you make any new friends when, when your school admitted blacks? And he said he had to, I was making him think. I think we just need many more moments like that in the right context. What they feel is that uh, they are not racist and they're very strong on that. And when I ask, well, what is a racist? They'll say, oh, a racist is someone who hates blacks. Well, I never hated blacks. Or a racist is someone who uses the N word and I'm offended by the N-word. If someone uses it on my Facebook, I unfriend them. So I don't either hate blacks or, um, or uh, use the N-word. Um, so I'm not a racist. So it's a very, you would say, confined definition of racism. It wouldn't explain why a black applicant for an apartment in Trump Towers was turned away, for example, or anything systemic. Um, but they, they would often say to me, well, look, we're no more racist than people in Berkeley or um, anywhere else, and look at Detroit and Chicago and all the racial tensions in Boston. So they would say, uh, all of us are partly racist. I mean, they would, they would say that. Um, uh, there's still a problem. Um, and I think uh, what we need is, you know, a, a kind of something like Joan Blades, who is the co-founder, you may know, of MoveOn.org here in Berkeley. And she's founded something called uh, Living Room Conversations, where you get left, right, together. And I've done one in my house uh, with her and some Lake Charles, Louisiana, <laughs> Tea Party Trump people. And um, what she does is kind of set up the context, much as you have, where you uh, begin by sharing what values do we share, right? And the dignity of human beings, for example, would be one. Um, uh, and they, uh, so you start there. And you could do that, it would be very important. Uh, and Joan tries to keep these biracial kind of groups. Um, so I, I think that's a, a good way to start. There's another one uh, uh, called um, High from the Other Side, which is <laughs> trying to do this kind of thing. Yeah, I would just say in the same sense that um, I believe that we in Indivisible take, need to take the initiative to reach out to Trump voters, we in Indivisible need to reach out to communities of color. It's us, you know, privileged white folks that need to go and take this initiative. So it's our, it's our challenge. It's a separate session, but it's something else we need to do. Next question. Um, this is kind of a two-part question. Well, in fact, it's a number of questions. <laughs> 
that I'm putting in two parts. Um, it's one of them is a, a, a version of what's been asked of you, Arlie, before, and it's um, did you persuade any of your Louisiana friends to think differently about what was truly in their interests? Um, I would just leave it at to think differently, and then I want to couple it with quite a few that kind of came down to this. Is the neural circuitry just sort of stuck? Can we change it? If you grew up with the strict father, are you stuck? Um, because, you know, it's all those nanoseconds away. So the, the, the both the personal piece of that, you know, did you shift anyone? And then the, the more, the larger question, I guess, is can we actually shift our metaphors? We'll start with Arlie and then yeah. Jennifer. Yes, I think so. Um, I found in conversations um, that I uh, sometimes would say, uh, look, I see it this way. May I try this out on you? And you let me know if that works for you. For example, um, the, uh, this was a highly polluted uh, environment, and the regulatory system was, uh, didn't work. The people were not protected by the state environmental protection agency. And so people hated the state for being dysfunctional, and then they thought, well, the, the, the state is just a micro version of what the federal government is like. So I put it that same collection of facts differently and said uh, to, in this case, it was another person named Lee, hey, Lee, isn't it that Louisiana is kind of an oil state controlled by state, that the state legislature, these are all oil people. Oh, yeah, yeah, exactly. And so doesn't it really control what the agencies of the state do? Oh, yeah. And isn't, in fact, the, the oil and petro companies are having the state do the moral dirty work for them? That's my way of thinking, my analytic frame, but I tried it out on them. Yeah. Yeah, that is true. And so you end up hating the state, but loving the company. Yeah. Well, there's a very important thing to ask here, which is what not to say. And, and that's really uh, quite important. Uh, what was the dem what, what what are the Democratic Party's mistakes? The first mistake comes from going to college uh, in the following sense. That is, uh, if a conservative goes to college, they'll probably take some business courses, and therefore in the curriculum there'll be a marketing course, and they'll teach you how people really think through marketing, and they'll learn to market their ideas because they think with frames and metaphors and narratives and emotions. And, that's, and unconsciously, they know that. But if you're a progressive and you're interested in politics, you will study law, public policy, political science, and so on. And in those fields, they don't teach cognitive science, neuroscience, or marketing. They teach enlightenment reason from 1650. <laughs> Namely, I think, therefore I am, says Descartes, therefore all thought is conscious when it's 98% unconscious that Descartes, being a mathematician, said it's all logic, just like a, a proof. Uh, no, it's not logic. If you, in logic, if you negate something, it's gone. Uh, in uh, real life, if you say, I am not a crook, people think of you as a crook, because if you negate something, you have to activate it in your brain and make it stronger. So uh, that is different. They assume that, uh, you know, that if you just tell people the, the um, that everyone has this kind of reason and they all reason the same way. So you just tell people the facts, they'll reason to the right conclusion. That keeps not being true. And it says if you just talk pe to people about the policies, uh, they'll get the policies right. Rather, you need to go to people's hearts, which is just what you say. 
That is, it's important to people to understand empathy, to understand the people they do care for, and to activate that. It's that uh, in-group nurturance thing that is important in talking to conservatives. And, uh, and it's important to use your own language, you know, to constantly talk about protections and so on. So you don't think they're, they're broken, that in other words, you don't think they're stuck, that, that you, you think that even though you grew up with a strict father in a very conservative community in, in Louisiana, and you know you listen to Fox News all the time, et cetera, you don't think they're stuck? I think the important thing is changing public discourse. That is, the great thing about Indivisible is that you guys are all over the country, that these, uh, the right frames come with the right language, like protection, like you know uh, the idea that you're profit creators and so on. All of those things, I can give you hundreds of examples of this, shifting the frame from the powerful to the people, to the people affected by it. As soon as you think that way, you'll think differently. And so this has to be repeated. Repetition matters. That's why Trump does it. By the way, people who think that Trump is dumb, miss it. He is not dumb. I've written at great length about why he's not dumb. He's a super salesman. He knows how to use your brain to his advantage. All those tweets are not random. I've done uh, an, an, uh, a uh, study of the structure of the tweets. They're all strategic. There are four types. Uh, we have a nice little diagram of all the types. And all, all the bombings are the same way. There are four types of bombings. It's the same four types. We can go into the structure of the bombings. But the point is that uh, the New York Times gets it utterly wrong. The, like one of the worst things I've seen in the New York Times was the editorial page on Sunday where they had a list of his quote-unquote flip-flops as if it was just, he was just tossing the, di the dice. They had this picture of him tossing the dice as if nothing was constant. There are certain things that are constant in Trump. Strict father morality with him as the ultimate strict father is constant. The idea that his power comes from wealth, two things, wealth and control of information. That's constant. And the third thing is in-group nurturance starting with his family. That's constant. Any other thing about minor things, about, uh, you know, uh, do you declare uh, China a currency manipulator or not, that, it doesn't matter. As long as, it up, as long as it upholds those first three things. Those are constants in his thought and in his, and his quest for power. Yeah, go ahead. At now or, or at the end? Oh, great. Okay, the next, a tweet. This is from Nate on Twitter. What do George and Arlie think the role of the media should be in bridging the gaps between left and right? <laughs> Who wants to take that? <laughs> well, <laughs> um, you should know that they watch um, CNN, uh, MSNBC, to see how they are portrayed. They, they want to know not so much who we are as how they are seen and uh, are offended very often um, by it. And otherwise, they, they watch Fox News as a family. I often, oh, I'm part of the Fox family. You know, and some people, um, you know, woke up with Fox and uh, you, I went for a car ride and you turn the ignition, there's Fox. So um, we need, what we ne now need is, uh, I think, some public interlocutors that model what we're talking about, that model exactly what we're talking about. There are two parts of this. Um, one, let me begin with that and then move to another, a second part. Uh, I think it's important, uh, if you're interested in that, to talk at the level of human values, 
you know, if you're going to, you don't talk about the general values of the EPA and, uh, and regulation and so on. You do talk about protections and then you get specific. And you look at, you know, where in the South there have been these things and who has been hurt by them. And you go to the hospitals where people are being treated and you talk about it, uh, you, you show it over and over for different cases in different places and you talk to people on the right and on the left who have the same experiences and, are the s and, and, and that they have to do with things like protections or things like public resources. Uh, all the, all those are things that you can do all the time at that level. So that's the first case. There's a second case that's very interesting. I, I was asked by, um, uh, on the media, Brooke Gladstone called me up and said, um, how do we cover Trump? And I said, look, it's, it's straightforward how you cover Trump. Usually, there is some important issue that Trump is trying to get out of and to change the values of and, and so on. So what you do is you always start with the important issues and you frame with the truth first. You start with the truths about those important issues, with what is known and how, and so on. Then you go to the diversion. You say, look, there is an, a, a, a diversion happening here, and here are the truths about that diversion. Then you say, go to what Trump said or tweeted, and you say it in 30 seconds, what he said, and you say, you can notice the difference between what was said here and the truth. That is what's wrong with in this diversion case, but now let's go back to the important cases and discuss more of the truth with 30 seconds on Trump. Yeah, and I just want to point out that Indivisible has changed the media coverage. Is that with our focus on town halls, demanding town halls, you know, we've, we have changed the media coverage. I want to say one thing about that that is wonderful about this, and I think that can be enhanced. Uh, Indivisible have said, first, when you go to a town hall, you say you're a constituent, you give your address, you say give your name, and so on. But I, you know, to show this, and then you talk about the human values stuff, all right? You talk about just those human values. But one more thing, they care about not just you and your address, but who you know. Where, now don't just say here's me and I'm my address. Where do you shop? Who do you know in town? Uh, you know, what the, are your kids in the Little League team and are you a Little League coach? Or what is your role in a, in a church and what church do you go to? Because what happens when you do that is that your candidate, if he's a Republican, will know that you are more than just one constituent, you're part of a major community, and that there is gossip. Con gossip controls politics. And it, it's a very, you know, I learned this very early in my hometown in New Jersey, uh, where um, my uh, best friend's father was a milkman, and the way he got his contracts with the schools to deliver milk to the schools was by playing poker at the Elks Club. Uh, you know, the Elks Club was the center of Bayonne politics, you know, and other places. Uh, like, well, I won't tell you all the other places, but <laughs> anyway. Next question. I'm deeply concerned about the polarization in our country, but I have progressive friends who don't believe in bridging the divide. What do you say to progressives who write off Trump supporters as irredeemable? Irredeemable. <laughs> yeah. I was gonna <laughs> not say that. Um, I would say uh, to uh, those people that you personally feel this is hugely important, um, but if they feel that they can't do it or don't want to do it, there are many other things to be done. As I see it, there are kind of three main pillars of activism. One is to defend democracy, and uh, if that is the uh, freedom of the press, the independence of the press, the independence of the judiciary, the whole principle of checks and balances. That's number one. 
the second uh, is re revising uh, the, the democratic platform, and the third is reaching out. And I think these three pillars have to be coordinated, uh, and that reaching out can help. That pillar three can really help with one and two, but if they're not up for it, there's a lot they can do. Get out the vote, uh, other things, run for office. But I do want to make a case for reaching out, and I'll tell you why. I don't think it's just a feel-good thing. I, I think it, it's important as a democracy. We are Americans, all, um, and uh, we learn how they see us, and uh, we learn uh, who they are, and that's number two. But number three, um, I think it's possible that in the next four years there will be some terrible attack and that our president may uh, declare a state of emergency. And in that circumstance, we know how he has divided already the press the New York Times, the Washington Post, CNN, ABC, NBC, he has called the enemy of the American people. This he has done, we know this, right? And the other press is apparently not the enemy of the American people. He's sliced us, he's the big divider. He is the big divider and he could divide us the way he has divided the press. Some are patriots, you know, and others are uh, unpatriotic. So uh, I fear that cleaver, with an excuse, that cleaver could come down. And so as a preventive measure, I think the shoe is on our foot to create a thousand bridges across this country where we are known uh, in, in talking just the way that George is saying of, uh, of patriotism. So this is a reason I feel it's extremely urgent. Whether such people who don't wanna do it, okay, they don't have to do it, but they should understand the importance of somebody doing it. Um, the issue of in-group nurturance is a very big deal because the way it works neurally is you have, in order to have in-group nurturance, you have to have two worldviews in the same brain, one major, one minor. Well, how can you have two opposite worldviews in the same brain? The simple neural answer is a circuit called, uh, you know, that is... Uh, goes both ways, mutual inhibition. The activation of one, whichever it is, inhibits the other. Now, if you can activate the nurturant worldview more and more, it inhibits and drives down the value of the other. Now, this is just what the conservatives have done to liberals. By using conservative language and taking over uh, the public discourse and over the last 25 years, conservatives have... Uh, driven down the values of liberalism and made liberals more conservative and moved them to the right by language that is repeated over and over and over over years. We have to repeat our language, the language of the people affected by power rather than people who are out there giving the, doing the powerful things. That is crucial. It needs to be said over and over. And it, it, if you do that, it will actually be recognized because those people who have in-group nurturance partly agree with you already, and that's what you've noticed. They partly agree with you already, but if you talk about, you know, highfalutin policies and, you know, uh, you know uh, the, the idea of uh, just t t telling people the facts over and over and over, that's not going to do anything. That's not going to work. What will work is talking at the level of the heart and the reality of everyday life. So we're, we're winding to an end, and um, it's five minutes to midnight in Roswell, Georgia, and we want 
we want everybody in, in GA6 to get up in the morning and get out the vote. So, um, so, 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 what are what are our next steps? Um, being, being, I, I was once at a, at at a at a speech by the very famous activist E. F. Schumacher, and people said, you know, what can I do to make this planet a better place? And he said, get up an hour earlier every morning. Um, so I, 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 those of you who are part, we ask you to join Indivisible and join us and get up an hour earlier every morning. And I would ask you to remember we have 567 days to the midterm election. So we have a lot of work to do and we can do it. Um, uh, I would also be remiss if I did not mention that if you go to the Indivisible Guide website, uh, there is a place to make a donation. Um, they're not running this. They're just one part, you know, of the network. But they're an important part, and they're helping us, you know, flesh it all out. So they need their contributions, as we do here, of course. Um, this has been an extremely productive and rich, rich uh, encounter. I just can't, I just can't tell you enough how much, how much I appreciate what you've done in your participation, and I want. To, um, to thank particularly uh, the wonderful uh, training team who did so much, particularly Paul Farrell, who was the event manager. Put your hands up, training team, and Paul. 